So Nigel, thanks for joining us. Um, we're getting to the business end of the Heineken Cup now, and obviously as a player, everyone talks about how special it is. But is it the same as a referee? Yeah, it is. It's something something special about it. Um, you know, the, the Pro 14 is a great tournament, and all of the other tournaments as well. And you get big games, big occasions in that as well. Particularly when you get to knockout stages. But then, you know, the the European Cup is is the next step up again, really. And um, it's some of those matches um, that I've been very lucky and privileged to be a part of over the years. You know, uh, are test match intensity. They really are. And there's something special about the atmosphere as well. You know, when there's a lot of pride and stuff around your sort of region, your club, your community, and there's, there's a, quite a bit of bite to the atmosphere which adds to the occasion. So, and, and it really is a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful tournament. Are there any games in particular in that competition that stick out for you? Yeah, we've quite a few over the years, really. You know, I've, I've been very lucky to be appointed to referee six European Cup finals. And um, I think the one that sticks out for me, really, is... Um, is I did Munster against Leinster in the semi-final of the uh, Heineken Cup back in uh, 2009 in Croke Park in Dublin. You know, it, um, 83,000 packed into Croke Park, and it, it was like a Test match day in in Dublin. Just a sea of blue and red everywhere. The atmosphere was electric, and and the game itself was it was a wonderful game of rugby. You know, it was it's where it was where sort of. Leinster basically overtook Munster really and went on to win the European Cup that year and then dominated it for the next few years and still do do now uh, again and it was it was a huge huge occasion and that's the one that really sticks out for me it was a wonderful game of rugby zone. Those Irish fans are certainly pretty passionate I remember well we've got Munster we're covering the Munster game this weekend at Thoma Park and obviously that place can be a hell of a cauldron I think for me I remember going as a youngster to Munster beer it at the Principality in the European final yeah. and all the Munster fans had come over, gone to France and bought all the beer it's allocation of tickets so it ended up with 70,000 Munster fans in the Principality. And they did the and same in, uh, in 2008 when I refereed the final there as well against, against Toulouse. It was, it was unbelievable. The atmosphere in the Millennium Stadium it was back then that yeah. day was electric. It was like a Wales test match. Yeah. It was un unbelievable. I remember they had to cancel all of the half-time pitch interviews and stuff because the singing that was going on through half-time, they couldn't hear a thing. Quite it was a wonderful, wonderful tournament. Yeah. So, your refereeing career, um, I heard that it started from a missed conversion, is that true? <laughs> yeah, it did. Uh, I played full back. In, well, actually, I started playing in rugby in about sort of 10, 11 years of age in primary school, and I played prop. And then I went to primary school, uh, I went to secondary school, I played number eight, and then a couple of years in, in secondary school, I ended up playing full back. Now, so that will probably paint you a picture of how, how, good, a ref, how good a player I was. Um, and I got picked, I was playing full back for the first 15 in school because we were a bare 15 in our year because it was quite a new Welsh school. And uh, we hadn't won a game all year. We'd been hammered all season. And uh, the last game of the season, we were playing against us called Griffith Jones, uh, a, a school down in St. Clair's in Carmarthenshire. And um, one of my best mates, Wayne Thomas, the centre, scored a try to bring the game 12 all, final play of the game. And my other best mate, Craig Bunnell, was captain. And I said, well, I'll kick this. You know, I'll, I'll kick the winning conversion right in front of the post to win the game and I'd be a, a hero in school. And I lined up to take the conversion to win the game right in front of the post, and, uh, and the ball went closer to the, to the corner flag than it did between the upright. And uh, my mates didn't speak to me for a couple of days. The score ended up 12 all. And John Bynan, the sports teacher, the late John Bynan, unfortunately, he was a great, great guy. He helped me a lot in my refereeing when I started and helped and coached a lot of Dwayne Peel, was a couple of years behind me in school as well. And, and John Bynan said to me, he said, Nigel, he said, and he said in Welsh, Ermoyna Nevo, he said, for, for heaven's sake, will you go and referee or something? And I said, right, okay then. And, and I did. I went to help out refereeing some school games in, in school, age grade games. And, uh, and that's how it started. And, uh, and the rest is, is history, as they say. So an early start, I think. Did you referee your first senior game at 16? I did. Um, I refereed uh, my first game outside the school uh, in Carmarthenshire. Uh, in, it was an under-15s Drew a Shield game. And my first senior game then was, um, was Tregaron against Nankaredig in the Llanethlin District League. And I was only 16 years of age at the time, so I couldn't drive. Um, and my dad couldn't drive further than a couple of miles radius. He'd never driven on a motorway before, so he couldn't take me anywhere far. So I told the fixer secretary, Arlene West, I said, look, I'm ready to referee now senior games. Um, 
I've done a couple of school games and age grade games. Um, but don't appoint me too far because my dad won't be able to take me there because I can't drive. And uh, my first game of the season came through and it was Nakarede against um, Tregaron up in Tregaron, which is about a, an hour and 15 minute drive right up in the, the mountains in, in West Wales. And I said, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to get there. And he said, oh, don't worry. He said, I've sorted out with Nakarede. You can get on the team bus. It's so my first game. I got on the team bus with the away team. They dropped me off about 200 yards from the clubhouse and the changing rooms so they wouldn't see me arriving on the team bus. I got off the bus, walked to the changing rooms and got changed, refereed the game and, uh, and the away team <laughs> won 9-6, last minute penalty. So back to the clubhouse, no issues and in the clubhouse afterwards um, everything was fine and then until the away, the home team heard the away team captain said to me, uh, Nige, come on, uh, bus is ready. <laughs> And everybody just looked around and I remember the bus taking away from the club bus in Tregaron and all the players and spectators in the windows and outside going like it's to me <laughs> in the bus driving, driving away. So that was my first experience of a, of a senior game. Did you bet you wondered what you got yourself in for? I then? was. I wondered, what the hell am I doing here? <clears throat> um, so at that point, you're obviously taking controls of, getting, of games of people who are a lot older than you. What was mm. that like, you know, speak, being in, not in control? in charge of, but people answering, men answering to yeah. a 16-year-old. must have been an interesting experience. It was an interesting experience and, a, and I think a very important experience as well and a huge learning experience because probably more so than, than now, back then, as the leagues and stuff were back then, you had a lot of sort of first-class players would come back down to their local clubs. You, you don't get that anymore with professionalism because most of the players will finish a professional career and, and they, they finish up playing. But a lot of them back then would go back down the leagues to their own local clubs. You'd come across hugely experienced players who'd been playing the game at the top end for 10, 12, 15 years. And now as a 16, 17 year old boy, you were actually refereeing them. And particularly when you were refereeing, you know, the the old front row would be in a bout for many, many years and they could try and pull the wool over your eyes. And uh, it was, it was a constant battle for many years, you know, in trying to impose your control on, on that game. And uh, I learned quite quickly, really, that control was a hugely important part of a game as a referee, no matter what different experience was it between you and, and the players. It was a huge, huge learning curve and, and I learned pretty quickly that I, I need to get a grip of this and make sure that the age does not become an issue. And did you find that imposing that control got easier as you got older and more experienced? It did, yeah, the more experience you would get and, and also the word of mouth as well, like you know if you refereed a side and then they'd know you as a referee and then the word would go about, hey, you may be a young referee but he doesn't take any nonsense so don't mess it and, and that would go around like, you know, so your, your experience and then would, would help you a lot as you get older and, and people then sort of, you know, knowing of you as a referee, you'd referee them before and they knew well, he doesn't put up in much nonsense so it was, you know, it, it would get easier then experience wise as you get older that age difference. Your reputation as a referee now um, with the players, obviously you've refereed a few of my games. I understand that there's a huge amount of respect, obviously, for your ability as a referee and what you do. But also, there's always that bit of banter. There's always a bit of give and take. There's a, you know, there's a very special rapport with the players that you have. Is that something that's always been the case, or is that developed over time? No, I think it's always been the case. But obviously, it's developed, you know, on your art of communication. And I think the more you referee, or the better you referee, then you earn the respect of the players and the player, you know they earn your respect and then that helps the whole bigger picture of, of refereeing then and uh, I think it's a lot to do with my upbringing I think on where I was brought up the way I was brought up the community I lived in um, you know spending time with my mates who were rugby players down the club and your, your people skills and stuff as well I think I think all that con contributes to it and um, it's always been who I am like you know I, I suppose I, what I am out in the field is no different to the person that I am off the field really yeah. in, in one sense and uh, you know I never go out in that field thinking right I need to say something funny or I need to be funny or I need to be pally with the players no you, you go out there to to referee that's the most important thing is referee your game of rugby nothing more and nothing less but in your personality and stuff like that you just I go on that field and I just I just be myself yeah, yeah. and you know when 
you know, that when, when the time is right, you know, you, you, you have a joke and a laugh. But everything I've said with people, and sometimes I've said something in the game, and all of a sudden it's all over social media, and I think to myself, oh, do, do people really think that was funny? You know, I, I never thought it was funny at the time. You just, you just say it as it is. Yeah. And, and I think that's important, that, you know, that don't try to be somebody you're not on that field, just, just be yourself, you know. And, and there's a time and place, I, I, I think, as well, you know, to have a smile. You don't penalise somebody and send somebody off to the bin and then make a joke and a smile about it, you know, and have a laugh about it, you know, you're there to referee your game. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I, I'd like to think that that experience has been, has been earned over the years, really, by, by me just, you know, just, just being myself and, and doing my job. And, and my job is to referee the game the best I can for the most important people on that field, which are the 30 players on the field. That confidence on the field and the ability to be yourself obviously comes across, but there's been times in your life, especially in your late teens, that you were going through something difficult. Maybe you didn't feel like you could, be, could be completely be yourself. How was that for you? Yeah, I was, I was brought up in a very small, old-fashioned community in West Wales, in a small village called Money of Kerry, with a population of about maybe about 140 people in the village. I was an only child, and your grandparents lived around you, and it was a very old-fashioned upbringing. I went to chapel, went to Sunday school, and, you know, went to a small school of about 14, 15 children in the whole primary school. So it was a very um, old-fashioned upbringing, I suppose, back in, in West Wales in, in the sort of, in, in the 70s and, and early 80s, growing up as a kid. Um, and then um, I left school, went to work on a farm, and then I went back to work in school as, as a technician. And when I was back in school, I was about 19 years of age, and I was refereeing at the time, obviously, and um, I'd been brought up by my mum and dad, um, you know, and taught the ways of the world. Um, you know, you, you get older, you get a girlfriend, uh, you get married, you get kids, and you become grandparents, and, and that's the way the world keeps on going round. And, um, and I wouldn't want my upbringing to be any different. And then about 19 years of age, I, I had a girlfriend and stuff at the time, and I started realising that I was... I started thinking there was something wrong with me. I started realising that I was finding myself attracted to men, and it was something I'd never experienced before. Um, and it didn't feel right, um, and I felt a sense of, of a shameness. You, you felt there was something wrong with you. You felt scared because you didn't want anybody to find out. You didn't know what this was all about. And I'm being brought up in this small village, small community at 19 years of age. I, I, I never met a gay person. I never knew what a gay person looked like or who was gay. Um, the only gay person that I could relate to was some of the very camp characters and some of the old sitcoms back in the 70s, 80s on TV. And I'm thinking that, I'm thinking to myself, I can't be gay, I'm not like that, you know. I referee rugby, I go on the rugby club with my mates. And, and then you used to hear that language around those very sort of camp characters, derogatory language, you know, puff say, shouldn't be on television, ah, they shouldn't be in this world. I think, oh my God, you know, what are, what, you know, what, what what are people going to say? What's going to happen if people find out? Am I going to have to give up refereeing? What are my mum and dad going to say? You know, are they going to speak to me again? And, and it was constant, constant fear, really. And um, on, the, on the odd occasion when I would experience something with, with another man, which was not very often, um, afterwards I'd feel dirty, I'd feel ashamed. You know, I'd, I'd scrub myself in the shower until I would cut myself to sort of, I just wanted to get rid of this, what I be believe this dirt was on me, off me, and it was a very difficult time. And, and I started suffering from mental health issues uh, back then in those sort of late teens, early 20s. And, um, and because of the mental health issues I was suffering then, of feeling down, not going out scared, people would find out. Um, I started comfort eating and I put a lot, started drinking a lot and put a lot of weight on. And then I sort of became obese. I was like 16 and a half stone. And um, I felt that I, you know, I wanted to lose weight because I wasn't happy within the body I was. And I thought, well, you know, people are not going to find me attractive, man or woman, if, if I'm going to be overweight like this. And I, and I came bulimic. I used to stuff myself with food, either comfort, eat or eat my meals. And I'd make myself sick three, four, five times a day sometimes, pretty much nearly every day where I'd go to the toilet and just bring back up everything I'd, I'd ate. And, um, 
and was like that for, for years and years. I, I still suffer from bulimia today, but not to the extent I did back then, although it hasn't raised its head now for sort of about six, seven months, thankfully. Um, and then I lost a lot of weight. I went from sort of 16 and a half stone down to, to 11, 11 and a half stone, very thin, very pale. And then I thought, well, I want to go to the gym now. I was still refereeing at the time. And I wanted to go to the gym to make myself look better, feel better. And I went to the gym, started doing some weight training. And then I started using steroids. I, I got hooked on steroids for, for quite a few years then. And, and wouldn't come, I'd take the steroids, I wouldn't come off them. So I was abusing my, my body and, and on steroid abuse. And, and one of the many, many side effects that steroids has is, you know, if you have an issue, particularly a mental health issue, it, it'll make it 10 times worse. It'll make your, your downtime or your down feeling, that depression, it'll make it 10 times worse than it is. And, uh, at the time I was sort of 24, 25 years of age, um, I was in a very, very dark place because I was scared. I was worried about people finding out would I have to give up refereeing. There was nobody out in the macho world of, of rugby. Uh, there was nobody I could, could relate to. Um, you know, I would secretly, on occasions, go to meet somebody. And, and you, you put your life in danger sometimes by going to some dark, seedy places to meet people because I didn't know where else to meet a gay person. And then about 24, 25 years of age, um, I was in a very, very dark place. I was suffering from mental health issues. I was deeply depressed. Um, I was bulimic and, and I was hooked on steroids. And, um, and I read an article somewhere that um, if you were to get chemically castrated, that you would get rid of any sexual urges that you had. So I thought, well, I've got a way out here. I've got what I believed at the time. I've, I've got to cure because I don't want to be gay. And I went to the doctor and I said to the doctor, look, listen, you know, I think I'm gay and, and I don't want to be gay and, and, and I, want, I want to be cured. I, I want to be chemically castrated. And he said, look, it, it doesn't work like that. And um, I left the doctor's surgery in, in, in a far worse place than I got in there. And, um, and then a couple of days and a week or so went by and then I sort of thought to myself and, and I was in a very, very dark, dark place and I thought, right, there's only one, eight, one way out here now. And... Um, I did something that I um, that I will regret for the rest of my life. Something that I will have to live with for the rest of my life. I I left a note for my for my mum and dad and said I didn't tell them why. I just left a note and said, look, I, I can't carry on my life anymore. I'm I'm going to end it. And uh, I'll never forgive myself for what I what I put them through when when they got up that morning and read that note and thought they were never ever going to see their their only child ever again and, and that's something I have to live with for the rest of my life and uh, and anyway I, I overdosed I, I left the house with a, with a, with a loaded shotgun because I used to work on a farm when I was younger and um, I left the bottle of whiskey and a couple of boxes of paracetamols and um, what I actually took to, to end my own life actually ended up saving me because I, I overdosed on the paracetamols and I slipped into a coma my mum and dad had phoned the police the people were out searching for me and they located me on this remote mountain where I was living, because I was still living at home at the time. And it was a sort of very cold, damp, late winter, early spring morning. And um, the police helicopter sort of found me by the heat sensors they have when they were searching for people. And uh, they wouldn't come anywhere near me for about a, a good hour or so because they could see I was still alive, but I had a shotgun on my chest pointing to the bottom of my chin. So they wouldn't come near in case I would pull the trigger or, or worse still, would I shoot it at anybody who would come close to me. And um, in the end, they realized, well, if we, if we don't do something now, I was going to die anyway. I, I got airlifted to, to hospital. I was in a coma. I spent two or three days in, in intensive care. And, um, and then when I come out of that, the, the, the doctor said to me, look, you're a very, very lucky young man. If it had been another 20, 30 minutes, it had it'd probably been too late to save you. And um, I stayed in hospital for another four or five days. And, People, friends, family came to visit me, mum and dad came. Still didn't tell anybody. Still that fear, you know, and a shameness of, of what I'd done. And then, after everybody left, after visiting hours, my, my mum came back. And, um, and this is the moment that, that saved my life. My, my mum came back and, and she said to me, um, if you ever do anything like that again, then, then you may as well take me and your dad with you because... We don't want to live our life without you. And, um, and she just left, and that's all she said. And um, I started crying in, in bed in hospital. And uh, I started thinking to myself, and I thought, you know, this is who I am. And 
I don't have a choice. That there are many things in life you can choose. You, you can choose what sport you play, what football or rugby team you support, you know, whether you drink or not, what you eat, um, you know, whether you're, you're a good person, a bad person, what, you, what, you, what your morals, what your integrity is, many, many things in life you can choose. But, but one of them is, is not your sexuality. You, you can't choose your sexuality. And, and I realized that that night and I thought to myself, I, I need to accept who I am here. Yeah? And, and that was the biggest challenge. That was the biggest challenge in my life. You know, when I, when I refereed that World Cup final um, three and a half years ago now, nearly in Twickenham between Australia and New Zealand in, in front of 85,000 people in Twickenham that day and millions and millions of people watching all over the world, the pressure of refereeing that World Cup final was unbelievable. Knowing that every decision you're going to make is going to be scrutinised by everybody. There'll be people out there. There'll, there'll be pundits out there. Let me see that again. Let me see if he's got that right. You know, the pressure of refereeing that he, that World Cup final was massive. It was a massive challenge, but but it was nothing. It was nothing compared to with the challenge of of accepting who I was, and um, and that there is no doubt that. You know, accepting who I was, and my mum telling me those words that night. And my mum, unfortunately, is not 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 with me anymore. Um, but there's no doubt she she saved my life. I was very fortunate to get a second chance, and a lot of people don't get that chance. And in a time where mental health issues are a huge issue, you know, people who suffer from it from from all walks of life, you know. Mental health issues has no prejudice. It doesn't choose, you know, or pick or choose who suffers from it. Um, and when some people say sometimes, you know, I, I feared we, we've, I've lost two young cousins uh, at the age of 30 and 26 in the last three years um, who've taken their own lives. A lot of other people living around in my area have taken their own lives at a young age. And sometimes you hear people saying, um, oh, it's very selfish of them, you know, and but you don't see it like that. You get to that dark, dark place and you think there's only one way out and, and you think that, you know, you, you are going to be a burden to the people that you care for most and you think, well, they'll be better off without me. But, but when you get that second chance like I was fortunate to get, you see, no, they're not going to be better off without you. They're going to be worse off without you. And when you see that, you can then realise how important you are to them and in their lives. And I think if a lot of people who are in that dark place suffering from mental health issues, if they can see that people who care for them are going to be better off with them in their lives, they will then sort of realise, look, you know, I, I, need, I need to seek help here and do something about it. Because that is the biggest challenge. You, unless you accept there's an issue in your life, whatever it is, um, unless you accept there's an issue, then you can't do nothing about it. When you accept, I'm suffering here, I need help, then you will realise how much you mean to people, and that, and, and that will help you. And, um, and that's what a lot of people don't realise when they get to that, that, that place, you know. And, and I'm sure it, you know, it was very, you know, when, when you had that accident, it, it, I can't imagine what it must have felt for you like at, 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 well, that, a, at that time. You probably can. Mm. It's not, it's, you know, they're very different, and I think what you went through is a lot more, it's a lot harder in some ways because for me, um, I never had, I was very lucky that it wasn't a brain injury. Mm. You know, I didn't change as a person inside. It was a physical injury and I managed to see it like that, but I had very much lost my identity in mm. the same respect. But just going back to the incredible, what you went through, you know, and what, you know, how you dealt with it in the long run and that moment that was the turning point where it could have potentially gone one of two ways. I just want, you know, for someone who's been through it themselves, what would your message be to someone who's maybe facing an identity struggle at the moment, facing something that's really challenging their life and maybe even trying to contemplate an easy way out? What would your message be to them in terms of actionable steps to start moving in the right direction? I think when you lose that sense of identity of, of who you are, um, and like I did, I, I was becoming somebody that was something totally alien to who I was and I was losing my identity and, 
and, and, and who I was. And I think when you get that feeling of you losing your identity or you're struggling with issues, whatever they may be, you have to accept that there are issues you need to do something about. And it's only, I think, when you accept, I'm struggling here, can you then do something about it? Because if you don't accept there's something wrong, you're just going to slip darker and darker. And then when you get to that dark and dark place, and you've lost all your identity, and, and you've lost the will to live, basically, and you're not going to accept that you have, then you can't help yourself. You have to help yourself first. And helping yourself first is you accepting, I have an issue here, being whatever that with, issue is, being honest, with yourself. being honest with yourself, and then speaking to somebody. Some people may accept that, right, I've accepted I have issues here, and I'm going to deal with it. And some people will deal with it themselves, and that's fine, as long as you've accepted and you are doing something about it. Others may seek professional help. Others may speak to a stranger. Others may speak to a loved one, to a family, to a colleague. It doesn't matter. As long as you accept there's an issue or an identity that you have to, that loss of identity that you need to deal with. And I think it's encouraging people to do that. And I think the more that people speak about it, you know, the more that you share the experiences that you went through in that loss of identity that you had, that other people who will go through something similar or go through the same experience that you've had, that they can relate to them, well, look, you know, Ed's gone through that, and, and look at him today, he's gone through that. I can get through that as well. And, and I think you should never underestimate the influence that yourselves and other people have on people when they, when they speak about things that are a bit taboo in the macho world of, of rugby or... In a, in a man as a human being, you know, it's, it's that macho image, you know, you know I'm, I don't share my, you know, I, I'll, I'll sort this myself, I'm strong. You're not so strong enough sometimes, you know, and it's not a sign of weakness when you speak out about issues. It actually is a huge, huge sign of strength in doing so, and, and that's what I think, you know, people need to be encouraged to do, and, and I think... You know, and rugby is doing a lot of work in that. You know, there are bodies out there, professional bodies and other um, bodies as, as well um, that are, um, you know, doing things in helping people in, you know, whether it's there are huge issues, you know, injuries issues that, that not only end a career but could, could change the way that, that you live your life. You know, um, players come towards the end of their career, whether it comes naturally because of age whether it's because of an injury, same for referees, and also as well, I think one of the biggest issues is with young people who are in an academy system, for example, and you know think, you know, I'm going to be playing rugby for the next 15, 20 years, and all of a sudden after one or two years, at 16, 17, 18 years of age, they're told, no, look, you know, you're not quite good enough, and all of a sudden the the world is falling apart, and. A lot of young people suffer with mental health issues and be, because, because of that. So I think there's a huge responsibility in, in all sports to make people aware of this and make sure that there are things in place to help and encourage people through this. And <clears throat> I've accepted my sexuality. I've accepted who I was. And if I hadn't done that, it's quite simple. I, I wouldn't be here today speaking to you now. That doesn't mean there are still issues that I have to address and... But what I've learned is to accept and to talk about that. And I'm coming towards the end of my refereeing career. I, I have another two years left on my contract or a year to this, to this June with the Welsh Rugby Union. Um, whether there'll be another year after that refereeing, I, I don't know. But my career is coming to an end in the next couple of years. And, and that scares me. I've been doing this for, for 32 years nearly. Every weekend, week in week out every single year for 32 years and in two or three years time it, it's going to come to an end I, I won't be refereeing anymore you know it, it's going to come to an end sometimes and and that does worry me I, I do i hope that over the next couple of years when that time comes it'll come naturally and i'll accept that and it'll become a natural flow into whatever i do next but i'm also a bit worried or Oh, what, what if it doesn't you know how am I going to deal with with not doing this anymore and, and that does does worry me um, but what I have learned is that if that worry does come 
that I won't let it get me down. Although it may get me down, I will do something about it and, and speak and, and, and ask for help if I need it. I think a big danger in sport is exactly that. A lot of players are tempted to or naturally end up putting their whole identity of them as the rugby player or Nigel as the referee. Mm. I don't think you do that personally, but that can be a danger because the one thing about professional sport is eventually it will come to an end yeah. and usually at quite a young age and it can come to an end quite abruptly. So if all of your identity is parked in that one thing and it comes to an end, then you've lost your whole identity. Your identity has to be, for me, partly in that, yeah, that's, that's part of who you are, but your values as a person, your family values, yeah. your honesty, you know, all of those things that people can't take away from you. Yeah. you know, that's who you are, those are your important things. And when rugby ends or refereeing ends, it doesn't matter because it will be hard because that's what you've been doing and you'll move on to something else. But the main, where your identity actually is, is over here and I learned that a lot in hospital you know I thought my identity was gone but uh, eventually I realized that actually every day I still had my friends and family around the bed and often there were people there who didn't even have that and I realized actually who I was and my my strengths were weren't anything to do with rugby that can that you can have that that's fine there's more important things here and that was my relationships and as soon as I realized that it was a lot easier to deal with losing the other the other part of me I suppose you can take you as human beings, something we, we are very, very selfish in one sense. Um, and you can sometimes, in, in a selfish type of way, um, but not in a nasty way, you, you take a lot of comfort in other people's experience or even misfortune. Whereas, you know, you, you, people have had rugby injuries and have lost all feeling in their body. Then for somebody like yourself, maybe that would be, well, I'm lucky here, you know, I yeah. can still do most things. That so perspective thing. Man. And that perspective thing. And the same, you know, when, when I lost my mum, at, um, I was 36 years of age when my mum passed away. And it, was, it was a horrible, horrible time. But then I found comfort in thinking, well, well hang on, a couple of my mates lost their mum at 14, 13, 17 years of age. So I've had my mum for 36 years, which is much more than... So you took comfort from, mm. from that. And that's why sharing your experiences and and helping people with their identity and there is there is more to life than rugby you know worrying about oh am I gonna get a row off the coach from missing a tackle in this game am I gonna you know have a lot of flack in the press because I missed a forward pass well yes you probably are but there's a lot of other things in life you know the most important things in life is is your identity as a person your integrity your morals your your values which probably would have been instilled in you as a young person and when a lot of people say life is what you make it you know I think life makes you you know the way you're brought up taught by your mum and dad or parents or guardians what is right or wrong the values of respect to say the please and thank you to treat people the way that you'd expect it to be treat, treated the community you're brought up within you know the values you learn from being part of the rugby community that value of, of respect, which is probably the most important value of all. The school you go to influences your friends, influences teachers, coaches. As you're growing up as a young person, all of that has a huge influence in you as a person and becomes a big part of who you are and, and of your identity. And, and if you have that, then it helps you so much in sort of living outside that, that, that bubble of what you can become engrossed in and you know, as a player, it's even more difficult as a referee because as a referee, you can referee if you keep yourself fit and, and referee well into your mid late forties. You know, I'm I'm 48 years of age next, but I'm still physically fit enough to go around that field and and refereeing well enough to be refereeing at this level. Now, players' careers will finish maybe in their early thirties, mid thirties. Some are very lucky to go on a bit more, but a referee, if you start young, you you have a much longer career span, but it's, it's still difficult when it ends. So a player is even so more important, I believe, that you prepare for life outside rugby and you prepare for the future. Yes, you have to enjoy what you're doing now and enjoy the moment, but you know, it, it's only a fool that doesn't sort of think ahead and prepare because you know, one day your playing will come to an end. Um, your refereeing will, will, will come to, to an end. And uh, you know, there's, 
as an old motto, as I know, and you, you prepare for the future, but, but enjoy every day that is if it's your last, because, <laughs> because one day you're going to be right. Um, I just want to pick up on something you mentioned there, and which was interesting. You said that life makes you. Do you feel as though everything you've gone through, um, you know, very turbulent times compared to mo most people's lives, do you think that has moulded you as a person? Do you think it's made you a stronger person because you've come through those things? Yeah, I, I think it has. There's no doubt about that, I think, because, you know, I, I wish those experiences hadn't happened in my life, you know, for... You know, the experience of, you know, of what I, in those dark, dark places where I wouldn't want anybody to find themselves in. And, and what I put it, my family and friends and my mum and dad in particular through in over those years. And, and not just that, but after that, you know, when they probably were living in fear of thinking, you know, is he going to try it again? You know, that, that affected their life. There is no doubt. But what that experience has given me is, is that ability now to, to not let myself go to that dark, dark place again. It's learned me now to speak about it. It hasn't stopped it happening. There are still days when you get that feeling, you're feeling a bit down for whatever reason it may be, you know, just, just one of those days or, you know, you've had a, a bad day in the office on, in the game on Saturday and the whole world is on your case and you think, oh, you know, it gets you down and, and little things and, you know, I don't have a partner at the moment. I don't have a wife or a partner. I don't have kids. It's just that, me. I'm on my own. Is that that you would hope for? It is. Uh, it is. Whether it'll happen, I don't know. But, but that gets me down. You know, my, my dad is 83 years of age. I'm the only... Th and I've I got plenty of close family, really good family. I've got plenty of godchildren and close cousins. You know, I'm very, very lucky in that sense because the most important things in life are, are your health and your family. If you've got those, then... You know, everything else is, is trivial pretty much really when experiences come along your way. And um, it, still, it worries me now that when my dad's not going to be around forever. I hope he'll be around for a long, long time again, but he's not going to be around forever. And, and sometimes I think, you know, well, I'm getting older. I'm, am I going to be lonely? Am I, am I going to be on my own? Am I going to have what is the normal family, you know, wife, partner, kids, you know, take them to school, get them to the first rugby match, you know, that, those little things which, which I have never experienced and which I may never experience, you know, and, and that gets me down. Sometimes I think to myself, well, you know, I, I go to bed at night and I switch that light off and, and I'm on my own and, and that gets lonely sometimes and sometimes that gets you down. But what I've learned from my experiences in the past is that I know what to do when I get those feelings, you know, I, I do things that I enjoy, I try not to worry about things, I speak to somebody, uh, or if I got really bad, really down, you know, I, I'll open up to somebody about it, and that helps, so I, I develop, have, those experiences those, have helped me. Develop those coping mechanisms through experience. Yeah. Yes, because there's no way that none of us can say, oh, I'm never going to feel mm. down again. Yeah. You, you can't say that, you never know what's around the corner, but you've developed that experience of how to cope with it. You've realize that, oh, you know, I know that it's not a case that, that I'm going to burden on these people, that they're going to be better off without me, because I know that's not the case now. I've seen that. I had that second chance. I've, I've seen the damage I did if I was not here anymore. And, you know, when you think that you're doing the right thing, you may think they're going to be better off without me. They're not, because if you're not in their life anymore, their lives will never be the same again. That, that, you know, a parent losing their children through suicide or for what, any event, you know, their lives will never ever be the same again. Their lives are, are changed and probably ruined for forever. They'll cope with it, probably, and you develop to cope with things. And that's what I've learned from those experiences, is how to cope with things when they do come your way. And, and probably more so than not is to prevent them coming away, you know, is I, I learned a simple lesson, you know, why, why do I worry about something I can't control? I'm going to referee in cast on, on Saturday. If I'm going to start worrying what the weather's going to be like in cast, I'm worrying about something that I have no control over. So I've learned, huh, forget that, Which is that's what everyone gone. worries about all the time. Well, exactly. Yeah. And, and so the little coping things like that, you know, well, no, there's nothing I can do about this. So... You know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to let this get me down and worry about it. And just little things like that. So I've I've learned to cope. It 
doesn't mean that I'm immune to it. I, I still get those days where you feel down, you know, just the same as the majority of us get. And that's important, I think, for people who are going through something really tough, is to know that when you come through the other side, you will have grown as a person. There are yeah. positive things to take out of negative situations. There is, and you will have learnt as well, and understand and realise how many people are going through something very, very similar to what you're going through. And sometimes you'll hear of so-and-so going through a, you know, a breakdown or a breakup in a marriage or losing somebody close in the family or experience difficult time with mental health issues. And you think, my God, I never thought that he'd be the type of person. You know, mental health issues has no prejudice. It can affect anybody at any time and anywhere. And I think sometimes that helps when you realize well, you know, it, it can affect anybody. And then it does, it does make you feel a bit better in a, quite selfish. You, you don't want them to suffer from it, but it does give you comfort and does help you. There, there's no doubt about that. And that's why I think it's hugely important. And we've seen that, you know, we've seen the likes of, you know, yourself talk about it now. You, you've seen the likes of Tom James from Cardiff Blues openly speak about the mental health issues and take a time away from the game to address them. That has sent out a huge, massive, massive encouragement and lesson to people who will and who are going through similar things. Have you found that rugby as a sport has been helpful to you in that respect? Rugby as a sport was very helpful to me and when I was going through those dark times, when I was roughing on that field for that 80 minutes, I was able to get out of those dark times. I was able to go and do something that I loved and that's why I'm still refereeing now. You know, after all I've achieved in the game, you know, six European Cup finals, world record amount of international matches at, the, at, at this moment in time, you know, world record European matches, Pro 14 matches, World Cup finals, every single fixture there is. There's nothing more I can do or, or need to prove. But why am I still doing it? Because I love it. I love the game. I like to give back into the game that I've been very fortunate to get so much out of. And there is no doubt that it helped me. Refereeing on a Saturday all those years ago was to take you away from the doom and gloom of that dark time and for that 80 minutes and after the game within the clubhouse afterwards. It helped me. So, so rugby has helped me immensely back then. It's helped me now. Um, if it wasn't for the great sport that rugby is, the people within rugby, that most important value, which is sadly lacking in today's society, which is the value of respect, which rugby holds so dear and quite rightly so. And that value of respect that we all must do all we can to uphold in the traditions of rugby and in the future of rugby. The support I had from fellow referees, from players, from, from the Welsh Rugby Union, um, from World Rugby, from other governing bodies as well, everybody involved in the game. The support I had after coming through those dark times and then a few years later after coming out, the support I had and encouragement I had allowed me to be who I am today. And I don't think at that time, if I was involved in any other sport, I, I don't think that that would have, would have happened, I don't think. So I owe more to rugby and the the people within rugby than, than they will ever, ever owe to me. Because it's, what rugby is, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what the, the colour of your skin is, your sexual orientation, your religious beliefs, what country you come from. None of that should matter one bit at all. All that should matter is, is if you were a decent human being, that you were to be treated the same as everybody else. And rugby allows you to be yourself, to be treated the same as part of that team, no matter what your political views are, the colour of your skin. It doesn't matter that you're different. Everybody in that change room is different in one way or other. But they are all part of that rugby family. So rugby has helped me in so many different stages. Early on, when I was dealing with the dark times, in getting through those dark times, in accepting me who I was. When I came out, I'd only done two test matches. 
And if I wasn't going to improve my performances, they would have been my last two because I wasn't refereeing well enough because I was worried about being found out. And it's affecting my performance. And if you're not in, a, <clears throat> in an elite sport, professional sport, unless you're totally focused, enjoying what you're doing, and totally focused at what you're doing, if something else is getting you down, it'll affect your performance. A little bit extra, you need to be the best. And it was affecting my performances. And uh, if I hadn't been allowed to be myself and accepted who I was in rugby, then I wouldn't have gone on to, to referee the, the next 83 international matches, the World Cup final, the record six European finals, you know? So, so I, I can't say how grateful I am to rugby as a sport, and more importantly to, to those wonderful, wonderful people in the sport of rugby, because um, I wouldn't be here today without it. There is no doubt about that. 16 years old, refing your first senior game in the mountains of West Wales to a World Cup final. You must have to pinch yourself sometimes. It's been a hell of a journey. It has. It's, it's had its positives outweigh the negatives by, by a long, long way. It's had its down times after some games when you read stuff in the media sometimes or people's personal attacks on you, particularly revolving around your sexuality from time to time. and. Um, you know, it, it, it has its down times, difficult times, but you know, you learn to deal with that and you get back out there and make sure that you learn from those experiences, learn from the mistakes you've done on the field, learn from the mistakes you've done in life. And uh, it has been one, one, one hell of a journey and um, you know, it'll, it'll come to an end. That journey of actually refereeing on the field with that whistle will come to an end, you know, in not the too distant future. Um, but then hopefully I will be prepared for, for the next journey and that will be to, to put back into something that I've been very, very lucky and I've been very, very privileged to be a, a part of. Um, and whether I will put it back in at the professional end of the game, I certainly will be putting something back into the grassroots and the community part of the game as well because to me that is the most important part of the game. That is where we all start, you know, we all start by the local club giving you the opportunity to play different age grades in the club, you know, the, the person who marks the field, the guy who cleans the changing rooms so the kids can get changed and have a safe environment to play the rugby to get coached, that's where we all start. And to me that is the most important part of the game. That can't survive without the top end, and the top end certainly can't survive without the grassroots community game. So, you know, when that, when that journey comes to an end of what I'm doing now, then, then I certainly will still be refereeing at that community games and putting back into something, as I said, that I've been so, so fortunate and so, so lucky to, to be a part of what I believe is, in my, my humble opinion, is, is not only the greatest of team sports in the world on the field, but without a shadow of a doubt, Rugby is the greatest of team sports in the world off the field as well. Well, Nigel, we've been very lucky to have you in our sport as well. Incredibly inspiring story. And I'm sure there's a few years left in those legs here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. My pleasure.